So, okay, looking at uh, chapter 3, the nature of matter, I actually thought about skipping this chapter because I found it confusing, and, and I also kind of suspected that, that a lot of the things that Russell says here about science, about physics, uh, especially about the, uh, the nature of light and uh, physical space, uh, they're, they're not correct. <laughs> I mean, my, my grasp of physics is very, very fragile, I have to say. I'm not, I'm not good uh, at that, and, uh, but I do know that, you know, this is written in 1912, and uh, a revolution in physics, in, in the scientific worldview, was taking place just at this very same time that Russell was writing. We have to remember that Russell was a contemporary of Einstein, of Bohr, of uh, Heisenberg, and all the rest of the great uh, physicists who overturned the Newtonian uh, view of physics and of the physical universe. So when we think of the way that <coughs> scientists thought of light uh, before um, quantum theory, the, the way that they thought of space before uh, relativity theory, um, that is pretty much Russell's view, I would imagine. And although I think he did a lot of work to uh, try to get himself up to speed on the developments of modern physics at this point, he's still sort of pre-modern in his thought. So, frankly, some of the things he says about light, for instance, it's assuming that light is a wave motion and that there must be a medium for that wave, is so, uh, which is a reference to the so-called ether, which is completely wrong. His notion that there has to be one absolute scientific physical space, which is, which is, uh, you, know, you know, objective space, you know, that there's one space for everyone and everything. My understanding is that Einstein pretty much established that that doesn't make any sense. Again, my grasp of physics and especially modern physics is pretty, pretty fragile, so I won't say anything definitive in that note, just to say that, that some of the things that Russell says here are unfortunate, you know, because he was writing before these things had really become clear in modern physics. I said in the last lecture that the name of the chapter is misleading. I, I, I believe that, you know, the nature of matter. He asks towards the beginning of the chapter, uh, the question we have to consider in this chapter is, what is the nature of this real table which persists independently of my perception of it? I don't really think that he ever answers that question. Maybe we just get more hypotheses. Uh, he, he immediately goes on to say that physical science, uh, more or less unconsciously, has drifted into the view that all natural phenomena ought to be reduced to motions. That is, well, okay, what is the nature of matter? Na matter is a series of motions. Well, that's just a, a hypothesis. It's not a philosophical argument or theory or even a metaphysical theory that's of any sort of developed form. So, I mean, and, and I, you know, I don't really think he goes much farther than that uh, in this chapter, but he makes some really interesting distinctions in this chapter uh, nonetheless. Uh, for instance, he says that, well, let's just say that, you know, what is what, what is the physical universe It's a series of motions? Well, light is a part of the physical universe, so then light would be a series of motions. In this case, he says wave motions. But can we really say that light is wave motions? Uh, he says, when it is said that light is waves, what is really meant is that waves are the physical cause of our sensations of light. But light itself, the thing which seeing people experience and blind people do not, is not supposed by science to form any part of the world that is independent of us and our senses. So I think he's making a really interesting philosophical distinction there between our best hypothesis about the intrinsic nature of the world uh, and the phenomena that we deal with uh, as conscious beings. That is, once we identify the causes of our experience of light, we have not, therefore, reduced our experience of light to the causes. We said, you know, what is it that causes our, our experiencing of light at certain motions, or we might say, you know, photons bouncing off of the surfaces of things and then, you know, into our eyes and things like that. But that doesn't really 
explain what light is as experience. That's the what we take to be the physical cause of it. But that uh, light is a private experience. You know, he says, well, blind people can't experience it. You can explain the physical causes of light to a blind person, but you can't explain what light is because that's something that has to be experienced. Uh, he then goes on to talk about space, uh, referring back to something he said in the first chapter about how shapes look to be different shapes. The same thing looks to be a different shape from different angles and how circular things will, from most angles, look actually oval and things like that. He says, again, different people see the same object as of different shapes, according to their point of view. A circular coin, for example, though we should always judge it to be circular, that is, judge it, think it to be circular, will look oval unless we are straight in front of it. When we judge that it is circular, we are judging that it has a real shape, which is not its apparent shape, but belongs to it intrinsically, apart from its appearance. But this real shape, which is what concerns science, must be in a real space, not the same as anybody's apparent space. So just as we judge the real shape of, let's say, the quarter to be circular, even though from most angles it looks oval, uh, we judge that there is a uh, an objective real space uh, on the basis of our experience of our private apparent space. And that goes for time as well. That is, the, the notion is that science, mathematics, um, <coughs> that they study uh, things that happen in a world of uh, that, that is one space, one time, uh, one collection of things, but that we never know that physical, objective, scientific space or time directly. We only know it through our apparent time and space, through what happens uh, in uh, sense experience, which is private to us. Now, he says some very interesting things about, um, well, what, what can we say about that objective space or the, uh, the external world? He says some very interesting things about um, what we can say about the relations of things. That is, he admits, um, well, he says, assuming that there is physical space. Again, that gets an assumption. It's not something that we can say for certain and that it does thus correspond to private spaces. What can we know about it? And maybe this is really what the title of the chapter should be. Not the nature of matter, but how much can we know matter, or what can we know about matter? He says, we can know only what is required in order to secure the correspondence, that is, the correspondence between uh, physical space and our own apparent private space. That is to say, we can know nothing of what it is like in itself, but we can know the sort of arrangement of physical objects which results from their spatial relations. And he's thinking of things like um, things being in a certain spatial arrangement and how uh, if we say that um, you know things are uh, certain uh, have a certain distance relationship to each other, say a collection of objects, that all we though we can't know those objects in themselves or even those distances between them in, in themselves, what what is invariable is the um, spatial arrangement of those objects. That is, one is always one side of another or, you know, between two others, no matter what perspective we take. So what Russell is saying is that although we cannot know physical objects in themselves, we can pretty much be sure that the arrangement of physical objects that presents itself to us corresponds to the way that they really are. Now, that may be a huge assumption on Russell's part. I don't know. Maybe it's something to think about. In any case, uh, so he doesn't really pay off on uh, the title of the chapter, and I think that what he goes on to do in the next chapter, idealism, is, although he critiques idealism and Barclay, Barclay's idea of the nature of reality, he, he presents a a philosophical theory that does attempt to pay off on you know, the nature of matter by saying basically that, that matter doesn't exist, that it's a contradictory or self-contradictory concept.